Wayfarer's Chapel is a national memorial to Emanuel Swedenborg and an ecumenical ministry of the Swedenborgian Church based here in Rancho Palos Verdes, California. We seek to nurture the spiritual journey of all wayfarers traveling through life. Our podcast features our weekly sermon and scripture readings. Enjoy. First reading is Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and for your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me, Against the wrath of my enemies, you stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his, pro- his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. The next reading is a uh, unique translation of the Lord's Prayer from Aramaic into English as opposed to the version that many of us are familiar with, which comes from the Greek and Latin texts before English. And it goes, O cosmic birther of all radiance and vibration, soften the ground of our being and carve out a space within us where your presence can abide. Fill us with your creativity so that we may be empowered to bear the fruit of your mission. Let each of our actions bear fruit in accordance with our desire. Endow us with the wisdom to produce and share what each being needs to grow and flourish. Untie the tangled threads of destiny that bind us as we release others from the entanglement of past mistakes. Do not let us be seduced by that which would divert us from our true purpose, but illuminate the opportunities of the present moment. For you are the ground and the fruitful vision, the birth, power, and fulfillment as all is gathered and made whole once again. And so it is. From the Gospel of John, chapter 7, Verses 32 through 40. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering such things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent temple police to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little while longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will search for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach to the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will search for me, but you will not find me? And where I am, you cannot come. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit, which believers in him were to receive. For as yet there was no spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some in the crowd said, This is really the prophet. Others said, This is the Messiah. From the writings of Swedenborg, uh, Spiritual Experiences, 1790, 
concerning the Lord's Prayer. When the Lord's Prayer, which comprehends all celestial and spiritual things, is read, there may be infused into each particular so many things that heaven itself shall not be capable of comprehending them. And that, too, according to the capacity and use of everyone. The more internally and intimately anyone penetrates, the more fully or abundantly the things of heaven are understood. And now may the Lord add blessing unto the reading, hearing, and living out of these holy words. Amen. C, E flat, and G, walk into a bar. <laughs> yes, you know where this is going. Bartender says, sorry, we don't serve minors here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's it. We're done with jokes. <laughs> this comes from James Finley as a reflection on mercy ever present. And he starts with a quote from St. Simeon, the new theologian. As you breathe out, say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. He goes on to describe the boundless nature of God's mercy. What does it mean to ask Jesus Christ to have mercy on me? It's to ask God to have mercy on me in the waywardness of my ways. I know by my own actions that I'm not true to the person I am really called to be. I know this is my weakness, so I ask Christ to have mercy on me. At the very heart of this prayer is the heart of Jesus because God is love. And when love touches suffering, the suffering turns love into mercy. Jesus is like a field of boundless mercy. There's an infinite love within us that we can in no way whatsoever increase because it's infinite. God is infinitely in love with us. But just as we can't increase it, We can't threaten it either. We're an infinitely loved, broken person. In acceptance of the brokenness, the infinity of love that shines through the brokenness gets brighter and brighter. There's a moral imperative to do our best, not to continue with things that are hurtful to ourselves or others and others. You have your list, and I have mine. That's important. But grounded in us is an inner peace that is not dependent on the ability to overcome the hurtful thing. St. Paul had a thorn in, in the flesh and asked God to remove it, but God said, leave it there. The thorn is the teacher, the place where it isn't looking good. If this is all up to you, but it's not up to you. It's up to God giving God's self to you as infinitely lovable in your brokenness and incompleteness. This is experiential salvation. Cynthia Borgo illustrates God's ever-present mercy. The story comes to mind of the little fish swimming up to its mother, all in panic. Mama, Mama, what's water? I gotta find water or I'll die. We live immersed in this water. And the reason we miss it is not that it's so far away, but paradoxically, so close. More intimate to us than our being itself. Mercy is the water in which we swim. Mercy is the length and breadth and height and depth of what we know of God and the light by which we know it. The mercy of God does not come and go. 
granted to some and refused to others. Why? Because it is unconditional, always there, underlying everything. It is literally the force that holds everything in existence. The gravitational field in which we live and move and have our being. Just like that little fish swimming desperately in search of water, we too, in the words of Psalm 103, swim in the mercy, in mercy as an endless sea. Mercy is God's innermost being turned outward to sustain the visible and created world in unbreakable love. So I really love that reflection and this whole uh, sense of it's ever present. It's so present that it's uh, in that stark contrast of like the fish that's already swimming in water and asking what this water is. That's ultimately where we all are. We're swimming in God's love. We're swimming in God's mercy. And it's always there. It's always available. And yet we always ask the question, why don't I feel that? Why don't I experience that? This unbreakable love is where I want to begin our exploration this morning of this much broader topic, Imago Dei and our cosmic parent. Imago Dei is simply uh, the words that mean the image of God. And if we don't have a healthy image of God, everything from that is going to be distorted. So having a healthy, clear lens of what God is and the nature of God and this description I just went into about that infinite mercy, infinite love that we're all swimming in is a a good place to begin. So as we celebrate all fathers, father figures, those who have been wise, wise guides and mentors and protectors of our physical and spiritual lives, we're also here to explore this at this spiritual heart these new opportunities to remove all those blockages within us that get in the way of experiencing that infinite mercy, that infinite love that is always available to us. These are the living spiritual waters that can flow freely from the depths of our hearts. So on Father's Day, I do recognize not everyone grows up with the perfect parents, fathers, structures in our lives, mentors or figures. Often that's not the case, and yet we, um, we still exist, we still move on, we still make it through life. And yet there's something in here, and it gets to why I want to explore part of this new version of the Lord's Prayer that you may not have heard before. Today can bring up memories, emotions, provide sacred space for healing as well as we look to our cosmic parent, that one that has been watching over us since before we even came into this world, continues to watch over us presently and knows where we're about to go in life, even if we have our doubts. Well, the Lord's Prayer is important. It's powerful, and we're going to say it again today together because it's familiar and known and has its own place I do recognize that some of the language used has been critiqued over the years, whether it's patriarchal. Um, When we really get into the essence of the nature of God, it transcends any gender, transcends any way of being that is um, binary. And so as we're exploring this together, I'm going to point this out but also hopefully give us a way to access the more familiar Lord's Prayer because it actually is, is very similar, and yet it accesses it at a slightly different angle. So as I read this again, maybe close your eyes, take a deep breath, just see how these words land because if you're imagining what Jesus spoke in Aramaic, unless we're actually understanding Aramaic and the time that they were spoke, it's going to be slightly different than 
what we've heard through the transliterations over the years. So here we are, and I can't say this is one billion percent accurate, but it seems pretty good in terms of the various uh, translations I've heard through the years. So here it is in Aramaic. O cosmic birther of all radiance and vibration, soften the ground of our being and carve out space within us where your presence can abide. Fill us with your creativity so that we may be empowered to bear the fruit of your mission. Let each of our actions bear fruit in accordance with our desire. Endow us with a wisdom to, to produce and share what each being needs to grow and flourish. Untie the tangled threads of destiny that bind us as we release others from the entanglement of past mistakes. Do not let us be seduced by that which would divert us from our true purpose, but illuminate the opportunities of the present moment. For you are the ground and the fruitful vision, the birth, power, and fulfillment, as all is gathered and made whole once again. And so it is. Now, the first thing that strikes me differently about this is a cosmic birther of radiance and vibration. To me, this gives us some explicit permission to feel these higher energies, the transmission of God directly. Another way of understanding this is that when we enter into the deeper dimensions of our soul, it is a connection point and a gateway into this same field, this radiant joy that is not of this world. So that begs the question, how can we know that we are connecting more deeply to the living God? How deeply can we feel that sense of peace, of joy? That is ultimately the test. So it's, I'll unpack a little bit of this. Soften the ground of our being and carve out a space within us where your presence can abide. Now, this is one of the more challenging statements that I found in this Aramaic version because it invites us actively to carve out the space where God's presence dwells. It doesn't come and go. It's not transactional. It's a deep, abiding relationship. Always present can be felt there as we go about our daily life. It also implies that if we're not actively engaged in this, God's presence is not a living reality in these moments harder to access, and therefore our hearts can remain hardened if we're not having that presence abide within us. And as someone that encourages a daily spiritual practice, this also means setting a few moments each day to just have between you and our Creator, just to recognize that abiding presence. If it's in the first thing in the morning, that's a, a great thing, and last thing before going to bed, that's a good place. Fill us with your creativity so that we may be empowered to bear the fruit of your mission. Now that's an interesting statement. Most people might be unaware that our creativity is all, all creativity is from our creator who created us. So if we are in a creative field, if we are spiritually awakened and we can feel the sense of flow, this divine influx, that will make whatever we are creating in this world fresh, alive, new. We have that energy. That spark of divinity is empowered in our creativity. And those are the spiritual fruits that will ripen over time. And the following lines are quite similar till we come to this next one. Untie the tangled threads of destiny that bind us as we release others from the entanglement of past mistakes. Now, of course, this might remind us all of forgive us our trespasses, forgive us our debts or debtors. And yet it has a slightly different take on this. And if we understand this, life is not a, a straightforward path. It's often quite messy. Lots of detours along the way. And at times we get this feeling of being tangled up in webs and I got to tell you, over the years of pastoral counseling, you know, this idea of feeling caught in a spider's web, of being entangled, is um, 
you know, pretty common for people that are in some form of crisis or trying to untangle things, unbind things. And it's a, um, I think this language really gets and accesses this in a, in a powerful way. It's an invitation to untangle these threads of destiny where we feel bound, we're bound to. It's as though without the spiritual awareness, without this living peace that is abiding with us, we are powerless to unbind not only ourselves from our past, but others, that we keep those entanglements going. So it's an open invitation I find here in this Aramaic version. There is a release of others who have been entangled, entangled in past mistakes. There's a severing of those cords, a letting go process that is happening in the same moment as we also are forgiving ourselves as well as we are forgiving others. And forgiveness is a challenge. It's a challenge for anyone and everyone, especially if we're going to be real about what that means and how we're going to actually give this up and give it to God because we're going to experience some emotions, some feelings in those moments. It's not easy. It's spiritual work. And then this next line, do not be seduced by that which would divert us from our true purpose, but illuminate the opportunities of the present moment. God gives us the freedom to choose freely. And yet God knows, like a wise, loving, cosmic parent, knows what our true purpose is here on earth and is always gently correcting and stirring and sometimes it doesn't feel so gentle, but It's usually those moments that are most challenging. In retrospect, we understand the powerful transformative power that was in those darkest hours, those dark nights of the soul. All possibilities and opportunities lie within this sacred moment, sometimes known as the sacrament of the present moment. For you are the ground and the fruitful vision, the birth, power, and fulfillment as all is gathered and made whole once again. And so it is. And that's the concluding lines of that version of it. It's an open invitation to gather together, to be made whole once again. And it's a powerful conclusion to what has been said prior to that. It inspires inclusion and wholeness and retrieving all of those parts of ourselves that may have been, they felt lost, abandoned, tied to the past, tied to unforgiveness, things that may continue to drain our energies, distract us from our purpose of being here on earth. But this feeling of being made whole, it's bringing all that back in this sacred moment. Abiding presence that becomes a part of ourselves, allowing for that abiding presence to dwell with us more fully, to bring about integration, to bring about healing, to bring about wholeness as our expectation of that inner lived experience. And if we're successful in living that out, I mean, we can use the the familiar version, we can embrace parts of this Aramaic version But this is the real work through that inner spiritual practice stated there in the Aramaic version of the Lord's Prayer. We can't experience more depth in our soul, carving out more space for that to be a living reality. And that's kind of what I get as, um, well, what Father Richard Rohr calls the immortal diamond. That place within us that is ever alive, it is part of that living reality, if we're able to enter into it and experience it, just like the fish in the water. It's always present, it's always alive, it's always real, and it's always here. And it's always an invitation to to deepen our our peace and our joy. So I want to conclude by addressing some of the, the scripture in the New Testament there. Connects to these living waters that flow out of our hearts. And, uh, well, I'll I'll share one thing that uh, 
I guess a quick example of how this can happen here in Sunday worship, and this is going back many years ago, but uh, I was reflecting on Father's Day, it's probably over a decade at this point, but um, one of those moments was when I shared my father, uh, we were camping, and he had uh, fried up some bacon, got the bacon out, and then fried some pancakes and some bacon grease. Yeah, and let me tell you, it's not healthy for you, but it is certainly tasty. And, um, and I shared that as a sermon illustration, and, and next thing I know, I think it was Thanksgiving at the Waring's, and they had a special treat for me, which was pancakes, fried in bacon grease. And it was, it was one of those heartwarming moments. I was like, wow, my sermons do make a difference. <laughs> so I'm not going into a whole lot of uh, sermon illustrations about my father today, but I, I wanted to get to this other piece because I think that is the... the the, the bigger perspective. I mean, there was a point in my life when, when I knew my, uh, my dad's health was declining and I started to think about my relationship um, in a more transcendent way. It, 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 the words of our father um, made it more of like, okay, I now have a, uh, a cosmic parent. And that, that was helpful. So let me just quickly go through um, some of those lines of Uh, scripture there from John. What does he mean by saying, you will search for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? Those words, they hopefully awaken our spiritual senses, our spiritual eyes, that we too are invited to this transcendent dimension beyond the limitations of this world. And the question is asked at a time when the assumption asked of Jesus was where he might physically move to, that they couldn't find him, where he might escape to, where they could not uh, go. So here in this day and age, when obviously we know the story, we're still wrestling with some of this. How do we really access the living God? How do we continue to wrestle with these big spiritual questions about finding that place where it abides in a way with us? And that Aramaic version of the Lord's Prayer does help us in making that spiritual leap where we can hopefully all deepen our relationship to the living God. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and let let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. It is no secret that we live in a very spiritually thirsty world. It's been observed that our world is even more materialistic in terms of its perspective and outlook in the world. Since that time that Jesus spoke these words. So as believers, we continue to seek out that which satisfies our spiritual thirst to continue to drink from those living waters. And this is where I believe we're at a crossroads here, currently on this planet that is consumed in the material and of the mind. I think this is an example of that is when we're wrestling with these big questions about quote-unquote artificial intelligence, and and yet that is something that is pretty... uh, you know, I I would offer is not really a soul-based system, right? And yet, that's where the billions of dollars and resources get thrown to make everything more efficient in the business world. So I'll leave us with this thought. As we're living into what I shared about the vision of the Garden Church bringing down more heaven and anchoring it here to earth, the new earth that we are to inhabit and we are co-creating in each moment. It's a different order of reality and it's not based upon forecasts, spreadsheets, the cheapest way to get a product to market. The new earth embodies and embraces what was shared today about 
whether it's the Aramaic version of the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer, the way of that active, living, abiding presence dwelling within us is guiding us, leading us, inspiring us in this moment to be living out in a closer alignment with the living God. When this clears, we're living a more heart-centered space. And that whole sense of divine love makes more sense because we're feeling it in real time. It becomes an emanation. And this flow of the, this river out of the heart of the believer becomes the currency and exchange that is the prophecy of what is to come. And so it is. Amen.